Well, hello, thank you for joining me today again on the Church History Trail. And today we find ourselves in Dungannon. And we're looking down towards the town. And basically where we are, we're actually on, on the hill of the O'Neill. As you can see from the billboard. And the pillars there are actually what's left over from the old mansion that used to be here. And so I will show you that later. And so that's the hill of the O'Neill, as you can see. And you can see there's a bit of a battle going on there at the minute. And that's the man himself, Hugh O'Neill. And as I say, I will show you the wee mansion, or should I say what's left of the mansion, uh, very shortly. But we cannot be certain as to when the first groups of Celtic people actually arrived in Ireland. There doesn't seem to be any evidence to place them here before the first century AD. And despite their small numbers, however, the Celts, particularly those known as the Gaels, soon acquired a dominant position in Irish political life. And so there were no pushover. And once Gaelic power had begun to consolidate itself, their most important dynasty was the Unil which started to carry out the conquest of the north of Ireland, or in other words, what we know today as the province of Ulster. And this is run for a house just in front of us here, and there's a wee billboard, which I'll let you see. And it says, The name Dungannon originates from the dim twilight of history, where tradition mingles with authentic fact. And... Then it goes on, it says, Today the hill of the O'Neill and Ranfurly House Arts and Visitor Centre reflect, reflects the Gaelic and planter influences on the history and development of Dungannon. And as I say, the, they soon conquered then the, uh, the, the north of Ireland and eventually they would, con they would conquer all of the north of Ireland. Now, this progress was resisted by the pre-Celtic Christian population in alliance with the Celtic Hewlett people. And they were the, the old British people from Ulster, or from where Ulster gets its name, should I say. And so under relentless unique pressure, the Ulster leaders were forced to retreat eastwards. And eventually, groups within the northern population moved across the channel along the western seaboard. And what I'm going to show you now is actually the old police station. And it looks a bit more like a castle, as you can see. But that's actually the old police station. And as you can see, it's the old constabulary barracks. Former Royal Irish Constabulary and Royal Ulster Constabulary barracks, dated 1871. So it's the 19th century, built shortly after the Fenian Rising of 1867. 1868 and it says it owes its castle-like appearance to the attempt to combine a defensive post with a police barracks and so there you are pretty elaborate even for northern ireland don't you think but there you go that was the old police barracks and it was more like a castle but of course in northern ireland it's supposed it had to be and whenever these settlers then Whenever groups of them went across the channel to, to the western seaboard then, it was these settlers who had been labelled Scoti by the Romans, where we get the name Scotland from, for their new homeland. And one of the things that these Scoti took with them to Scotland from Ulster was the Gaelic language, which had been introduced to Ireland by the Celts. And in the later century of the 1600s, the return, the return of the Scots during the plantation of Ulster was actually seen as the great homecoming. And so one of the great religious figures of Ireland in the 6th century was Columba. And he was actually a prince of the Unil. And he became a close friend of Cumgall, the Cruthan abbot of the monastery at Bangor. And I'm sure at times their relationship was strained. Because remember, the Unil was invading the north and they were deposing the, the Cruthans people 
and so these were actually these two monks were actually from the two different people groups and so I'm sure their relationship was strained at times and it was only Christianity it was only Christ that bound them together in the spirit of in the spirit of unity and the Comgall was actually the uh, the abbot of the monastery at Bangor. I showed you the um, the abbey in another wee uh, video where I talk about the monks. But here you can see the view. Now it's not a clear day today, so you're going to be limited to what you can see. But on a clear day, it's there's a good view up here. I've been up here in the summer, and it's brilliant, and it gives you the billboards to where everything is. You can even see the spurns. In fact, it was said that O'Neill could actually see the kingdoms that he was reigning over from here. And so you get a good view, as you can see. And I believe that's St Anne's, that church there. And then that one there is the Roman Catholic Church. And so you get a good view from up here. And as I say, I'll show you the the ruins of the house shortly. And we have today all to ourselves because there's actually nobody about. So it's fantastic. It means I don't get interrupted <laughs> while I'm doing the wee videos. So it's brilliant that way. Now, this site was also at the centre of the Nine Years' War from 1593 to 1603. And in 1595, Hugh O'Neill became the clan's leader, and he was no known as the O'Neill. And he was the Earl of Ty Tyrone, and he was the last inaugurated chief of the O'Neills, which were originally O'Neill or O'Neill. And so the hill of the O'Neill then was the Earl's stronghold. So you're actually in what was the Earl's stronghold. And it was from here that the O'Neill... O'Neill led the rebe uh, a rebellion against the English monarchy during the Nine Years' War. And you have to say the, the O'Neill was, was a military genius, there's no doubt about it. He repeatedly got the better of the Crown Generals in Ulster. However, after a bitter defeat at the Battle of Conceal in 1601, he would eventually formally surrender to Lord Mountjoy at Mellifont Abbey, signing the Treaty of Millefont in 1603, uh, bringing the Nine Years' War to an end. And so here you are on the very top of the Hill of the O'Neills. And as you can see, that's what's left of the mansion house. And there's a billboard here, and it's got more information on the occupation on the hill. So it's well worth a visit, plus the Ron Flurry House is, I've been in there as well, it's, it's a visitor centre, but it's really a museum, it's brilliant. You'll enjoy it as well. And that's a great uh, dagger, or drawing there of the house and its heyday, I like that. I think that's very good. And in 1607 then, Hugh O'Neill, along with the Earl of Tyrconnell and about 90 followers, uh, sailed actually for Spain in what became known as the Flight of the Earls. Now, nobody knows why, because they had surrendered in 1603 with the Treaty of Millefont, and so this was now 1607, and so it's a bit of a mystery as to why they actually fled to the continent. And the settlers, or the planters as they were called, then they came from Northern Ireland. So this led, or sorry, from Northern England. So this led actually to what's known as the Plantation of Ulster in 1609. But as I say, in 1607, the Earls fled. But again, it's a mystery as to why. And also from Southern Scotland, planters came as well, which became known as the Great Homecoming. And so the town in Dungannon, the town and the castle of Dungannon were granted to Sir Arthur Chichester and he was the architect of the plantation. And I'm just going to let you see the buildings here. This is, you're now standing in the house, as you can see, at least what's left of it. I would make you a cup of tea, only there's nothing to make it on. And so this is what's left of the house. And at least we have some of it left. And them pillars are brilliant. 
I have to say, they're fantastic. It gives you a bit of a feel for the house, what it was like. And you can see the, the way it's laid out. So it's great that way. Of course, this wasn't the castle, this was the mansion. I like to see the other one. I don't like to see that there. That means it's crumbling, unfortunately. Hopefully they'll be able to sort that out so it doesn't crumble anymore. Now, the castle had been burnt in both 1595 and also 1602 by Hugh O'Neill as the Crown forces were actually closing in on the Gaelic Lords and so they burnt it so that um, it would be, be no use to the enemy. And Chichester then he rebuilt the castle and in the 1641 rebellion the castle was captured by Sir Philem O'Neill and also then during the Cromwellian period in 1649 the castle was dismantled by order of the parliament in London. Now some form of fortification remained in use here in Castle Hill since there was a castle, since the, there was a garrison in the castle in 1688. So they must have rebuilt it in some form. And it was garrisoned by the Reverend George Walker, who would be known to history for his contemporary account of the siege of Derry Stroke London Day. And Colonel Stewart for the Williamite cause. So this was garrisoned in 16, uh, 1688. And the castle then was also damaged during the uh, Williamite period. And the land was then sold to Thomas Knox, first Earl of Ronfurley, and that's where you get Ronfurley House for the visitor center. And it was sold in the late 18th century. And uh, he built a fine house on the hilltop. And as I say, the two ruined towers here that you can see, they are actually the remains then of the mansion. And so there's not a big lot that remains of the mansion, but at least it gives you an idea of something of what it was like. And the castle was partially actually excavated in 2003 and again excavated in October 2007 by the Channel 4 programme Time Team, if any years have seen Time Team, Time Team. And they uncovered part of the moat and actually walls of the castle. And there's a wee stone here. And when I say a wee stone, everything's wee in Northern Ireland. It's actually a big stone. But uh, I'm going to read it out to you here. It says, Location of O'Neill's Castle and Arthur Chichester's Fort. And so you can see there, you've got number one, wall of the O'Neill Medieval Tower House. And then number two is the wall of the early 17th century spear ship Bastion. Bastion. And then number three is modifications made to the monument, probably in the late 17th century, to transform the site for use as an artillery platform, which is number three. And I'm going to read this out to you then. It says, This stone marks the location of the principal castle of the O'Neill Lordship of Tar Eglin. And the medieval castle was subsequently remodelled and reused in the early 17th century as a military fortification by Sir Arthur Chichester following the end of the Nine Years' War, 1594 to 1603. But the building had been demolished by the end of that century. Its location was identified and its fortifications were revealed during a time time archaeological excavation on the hilltop during October 2007. And there you can see Hill of the O'Neill and Ron Furley House. And so that's the Hill of the O'Neill then. And I hope you've enjoyed our tour today of the Gaelic Lords and Hugh O'Neill and the Hill of the O'Neill and stay tuned for another wee video in which I'm going to show you the Williamite connection to the Castle Hill. God bless.